This class, we're moving on to uh, written history and the debate between the geocentrist worldview and the heliocentric worldview. Geocentric worldview is the Earth is at the center. It's not rotating. Everything's moving about us. The heliocentric worldview puts the sun at the center, and Earth merely is a planet rotating around the sun. So we'll look at both of those. But before we get into it, let's just start with the list of everything in the universe known at that time, not like known now. That'd be a long list. So we're going to start with the geocentric universe, which is going to take us back to the ancient Greeks. So in the time of the ancient Greeks, what did the universe consist of? What are the objects that we're responsible for explaining? What's the most important object in the geocentric universe? Earth. Earth. Yep, so that should be first on the list. So we got the Earth, which in this worldview is just, it's the center of the universe, it's not moving, we're living on it. Now, um, we're probably the next two most important things in the universe. Sun and moon, and we've talked about those a lot, and we'll talk about those again in just a second. And after the sun and the moon, what are the most important things? Stars, and what's the other category of objects out there? Planets, yeah. So we'll list them both here. We've got the um, planets. And we've talked about these before. These are these bright points of light that wander across the sky. And I'll explain again what I mean by wander. And we have the fixed stars. I'll call them fixed stars because the idea is they're fixed to the celestial sphere. Back then they thought that there actually was a sphere there. Again, we can't see distance. So there's no concept that these are all at different distances occupying three-dimensional space. The idea is there's a giant, transparent, maybe crystalline sphere, and the stars are literally attached to it. Now, nowadays we know that the stars do move with respect to one another. We can measure these differences, but back then you couldn't. They all seem to move together across the sky. So they're fixed to the celestial sphere. Now with the planets here, let's list the planets that are known back in that time. So how about you rattle them off to me? What's the first one? Okay, not the first one, but I heard Jupiter. That's one of the planets. Neptune? No, Neptune was not known back then. Uh, Neptune cannot be seen with the naked eye. It requires a telescope, and that didn't come along until uh, some, quite some time later, Galileo. So what are the naked eye planets? Venus, Mars, Mercury. Mercury is a naked eye planet. So let's see, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Earth is not on the list because Earth is its own object, it's the center of the universe. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Now, Uranus and Neptune are too faint to see. The dwarf planets, such as Pluto's the most famous example, too faint to see, so they're not known back then. Mercury is naked eye, though it's really hard to see. I, myself, have never seen Mercury with my naked eye. It's always very close to the sun in the sky, so you can only see it right after the sun is set or right before the sun rises if Mercury is in the right position. And you need a clear horizon, no obstructions. All right, so we've got our list of everything in the universe. I mean, there are other things that you may think of, like comets uh, that come periodically bright in the sky, meteors during meteor showers, a little flash of light, the shooting star. But back then, those things were considered atmospheric phenomena. They weren't actually part of the cosmos. Back then, it was thought that the atmosphere of our planet extended all the way up to the moon. And in reality, we know it's paper thin. It's empty space between us and the moon. But back then, they thought the atmosphere was huge and that these were atmospheric effects like clouds. And we'll talk more about that later. So this is a complete list of what needed to be explained in the geocentric model and also the later heliocentric model. So let's talk about the motions of these things. Um, we have, you know, the fixed stars, we've talked about that a lot. They cycle around once every sidereal day, going from east to west in the sky. And everything, the sun, the moon, we see everything rise in the east and set in the west. But there are slight differences. The sun and the moon are traveling at different rates. If they traveled at the same rate as the fixed stars, then the sun would always be in the same constellation and we'd always see the same constellations at night. The sun wouldn't move with respect to the stars. We would, the constellations wouldn't change over the course of the night. We know the sidereal day is four minutes shorter than the solar day, so day after day after day, a change builds up, and the constellations shift around. So the point here is the sun is traveling at a slightly different rate east to west. 
uh, and the moon also at a different rate east to west. But I should say, just in general, uh, everything travels east to west you know, over the course of the night. But, so everything travels east to west, I'll write that, over uh, the night. But, uh, the sun and the moon are traveling west to east with respect to the fixed stars. Again, they rise in the east, set in the west, but if you take out that daily motion, everything going round and around and around, and just look at where the sun is with respect to the stars, take out Earth's rotation as we now know it to be, the, the sun drifts very slowly from west to east. We call that prograde. That's kind of the natural motion of things in the sky with respect to the stars. So this is prograde motion. Okay. Let me uh, actually put up a figure to kind of explain this here. So here, here's a good analogy, a merry-go-round. We've all played on these when we were kids. So suppose here we have a merry-go-round, and suppose it's one of those where the center just is stationary, doesn't rotate with the outskirts, so you can stand on it and watch everything go around you. And so here we have kids, they're, they're sitting on the merry-go-round horses, and you just watch them going around in one direction. Everything's going around you. Uh, let's, you know, the analogy would be the stars going around you once a day. But suppose you have two bad children who got off their horses and moved uh, inward a little bit. Here it's marked with the red and blue circles, child one and child two. And they start moving uh, in the other direction. They're moving slowly compared to the overall speed, the angular speed at which the merry-go-round's going. So to you standing there, they still seem to be going in the same direction as the horses. They sweep by you every time the merry-go-round goes around. But uh, they're moving at a slightly different speed than the horses because they're moving with respect to the horses in the prograde direction just uh, a little bit with uh, the moon going at one speed and the sun going at a different speed. Make sense? So it's the same idea in the geocentric model here. We have Earth. Everything is going around in the east to west direction, but with respect to that outer sphere of stars, the, the moon sphere and the sun sphere is moving a little bit uh, prograde, west to east. We good with that? Okay. So that's uniform motion. Uniform circular motion. And I'm going to make a point of that in a second. Let me write it down, though. Uniform circular motion. That's what we see with the fixed stars, the sun and the moon. They're just moving at different uh, speeds, but it's uniform speeds. Okay, the things that we need to explain. There are three things that we need to explain, whether it's the geocentric model, the heliocentric model, whatever model has to explain these three observable effects. The first is retrograde motion. And this is referring to the planets. So we said the sun, the moon, the stars, it's uniform circular motion. But the planets are not behaving that way. They're wandering. Uh, sometimes going faster, sometimes slower, so it's not uniform motion. Here's uh, just track of Mars going across the sky. We've got east on the left and west on the right in this figure. And the normal motion, the prograde motion, is west to east. Just, the planets are going around the sky with respect to the stars, west to east. Again, they rise in the east and set in the west every night. But with respect to the stars, they're slowly moving west to east. But then there are these periods where they stop. Like here, if we follow the track... Around January 1st, 2010, Mars stopped and started heading retrograde, the other direction, east to west, just for a little bit, a couple months, and then around March 1st, it stopped and started going prograde again. And the planets do this, all the planets do this. So it's not uniform motion. So that it's going to be trickier to explain. But it needs to be explained. The second thing that needs to be explained is brightness variations. Sometimes the planets are brighter, sometimes they're fainter. Nowadays, we have uh, careful measuring devices. We can make very precise measurements here that probably would have been useful in ancient days. Back then, they only had their eyes, so it's a little bit more qualitative. But uh, it's pretty clear, even to the human eye, that the stars are brightest when they're going through retrograde. So these two things are... Did I say stars? I meant to say planets. The planets are brightest when they're going through retrograde. So these two things are tied together. 
So whichever model we put together, when the object, when the planet's in retrograde, it has to be brighter. And that's usually done by making it closer to the Earth in these models. And then the final thing that we have to explain, again, either the Greek model or more modern models, Mercury and Venus are always near the Sun. Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, we can see them on the exact opposite side of the sky. The sun can be going down, they can be coming up. And it can happen that way. But Venus and Mercury are always within some angle of the sun. You'll never have it on the opposite side of the sky. It can never build up that much of a displacement from the sun. That needs to be explained as well. These are the three big things we need to explain, all involving the planets. Okay, so let's, let's try to explain the planets. We'll begin with Aristotle. Uh, any questions about that so far? Okay, we'll go back to Aristotle, 384 to 322 BC. He put together these ideas, kind of based on his mentor's ideas, Plato, about, well, it's, there are these aesthetics that are incorporated into the Greek models. The aesthetics are circular motion and uniform motion. So together you have uniform circular motion. And it's, it's just an aesthetic. They want to build up their explanation of the universe out of circles that are moving uniformly. Now with the fixed stars, not a problem. You have a giant sphere, the stars are painted on it, it goes around the Earth once a day, you explain the motion of all the stars that way. The sun and the moon, since their motion is uniform west to east, with respect to the stars, you put them on giant spheres, they're spinning a little bit slower than once per day, and so the stars are getting ahead of them, or they're falling backwards with respect to the stars. But just big spheres, circles, moving uniformly. But the planets, you can't do that because of the retrograde motion. So here's the idea that Aristotle put together. Two circles. You have a circle on a circle. So the big circle is called the deferent. Nowadays, we just kind of call this the orbit. Uh, but then you have something that does not have an analogy in the heliocentric model, and that is the epicycle. So the deference is the big one, and the epicycle is the smaller one, the little one. So here's kind of how it works. Your planet is attached to, to the epicycle. The epicycle, the center of the epicycle, is somehow magically attached to a point of deference. Now, you see the arrows there, the deference moving at a particular speed, the epicycle is moving at a faster speed. So there are times when these two motions add together, and the planet will be moving, it will appear to be moving rapidly across the sky as viewed from Earth sitting motionless at the center. But there are times when it's on this side of the epicycle, and since this motion is faster than that motion, it will actually move backwards. The deference is carrying it to the left, but the epicycle is carrying it to the right faster, and so you get this kind of reverse, retro, you get retrograde motion in this model. Does that make sense? A so pretty simple idea, and he gets to continue to use uniform circular motion. Let's put those two together, make non-uniform motion out of uniform, uniformly rotating circles. How good is it? Well, it's you know it's close, but not perfect. Oh, here here's a demonstration of that. So the blue line is the, the sight line from Earth to the planet, and it's tracing out the path with respect to the stars. You can see there it's in retrograde when it's closest to the Earth. And you get something nice out of this too. The different epicycle combination, it's closest to Earth in retrograde. You see it there, and if we just go back here, this is when it's closest to Earth when it's in retrograde, and then it's most likely going to be brightest. Something's closer to you and it's reflecting light, the closer it is, the brighter it will appear. So this model explains both retrograde motion and why it's brighter when in retrograde. That's not bad. Okay, but how good is it? Well, you can go out and you can measure. You can actually use this model to make predictions. And even in ancient Greek times, you can go out and measure with enough accuracy to know that it's not right. It's close, describes it qualitatively, but quantitatively it's missing the mark. 
So the next person to come along to take a stab at this was Ptolemy, the silent T. This is around 140 AD, so many centuries later. What Ptolemy did is he shifted the deferent and epicycle centers He tweaked the model. So here's just a little figure showing the, the tweaking of the deference center. The deference in this picture is no longer centered on Earth. It's a little bit above Earth or off to the side in one particular direction. And in this picture, the epicycle is still centered, but in Ptolemy's model, he actually offsets the epicycle as well. It's a little tricky how he does it. It's kind of a fictitious offset. And you think about how it would move if it's offset, but then you project it back onto this epicycle. We don't have to go into that kind of detail. But what Ptolemy did is he introduced some extra wiggle room in the model. So each deference can be offset a certain amount in a certain direction. Each epicycle can be offset at a certain amount in a certain direction. And that gave the model a little bit more flexibility. If you pick the right offsets, Ptolemy's model is actually quite good. And it's still not perfect, but very close. To the point that it's... Um, Page. It was um, relatively unquestioned. Relatively unquestioned for 13 centuries. So here's the whole thing together. If you look at this carefully, you notice all the circles are not concentric. They're not equally spaced or uniformly spaced. Some are a little bit off on one side or the other. Those are the different offsets. And so you can, you can see the degree to which they've been incorporated. Now, th there's some arbitrariness in the model. No one knows the distances. There's some ambiguity there. And the way it's traditionally done is you pack it as tightly as possible. We so think such that the spheres don't intersect one another, you don't have planes running into each other, but it's very close. So at the center we have the Earth, and then around that you have the Moon, and then you have Mercury's deferent and epicycle, Venus's deferent epicycle, the Sun, since it moves uniformly like the Moon, it doesn't require an epicycle. The epicycles are to account for non-uniform motion. And then you have the three outer planets, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, with their epicycles. So this is a close path configuration. And the last thing I should point out, we talked about explains retrograde motion, explains brightness variations, but the last thing we have to explain is why Mercury and Venus are always close to the Sun. And it's just done in the model because you have to pick the rates at which everything moves. They pick it such that the angular speed at which Mercury's epicycle moves around the Earth is the same as the angular speed at which Venus's epicycle moves around the Earth. Is the same as the speed at which the sun moves around the Earth. You can imagine drawing a line between the Earth and the sun. The center of Mercury's epicycle and the center of Venus's epicycle will always be on that line. Not due to any physical reason, they just insist on it in the model. And if you do that, Mercury and Venus are consequently always within some angular distance to the sun. You can't have Venus on the other side of the sky if its epicycle is always between the Earth and the sun. That makes sense? Okay, so that's how the Greek model explains everything. But, you know, modern scientists that presented this for the first time and look at this and just kind of laugh, there are 200, if I remember correctly, 206 buttons and knobs and levers here, parameters, numbers that you have to pick. Uh, how fast should I make each different move? How fast should I make each epicycle move? What are the different offsets? How big? In what direction? What are the epicycle offsets? How big? In what direction? And in modern days, if you have a model with 206 parameters, you can explain just about anything. That's, that's the idea. In modern science, simplicity is a virtue. Um, given two models, the simpler one is often the correct one. That's Occam's razor. It's not absolutely true all the time, but it's a good guide in trying to explain things. Here, I'll give you an example. This doesn't have 206 parameters it has probably a little bit more um, at a load in just a second. It's a, a model with 100 epicycles. Okay, so it's one planet but with 100 epicycles. Just to show what you can do with a lot of parameters.
Deconstruction of Planck's mo motion, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So it's one planet with a hundred epicycles. You probably have two, three hundred parameters describing this. And this will show you, you know, you can have incredibly complicated motion. I'm going to speed it up a little bit. Basically, the point I'm trying to make is you can do anything with hundreds of parameters. As you'll see in a second. We'll start tracing it this time. And this will repeat. It draws out the same thing time and time again. Once you figure it out, yell it out. <laughs> Someone had a lot of spare time on their hands to figure this out. <laughs> And so there it goes again. Okay, that's just to illustrate the point. Um, they didn't understand it then, but with that infinitely complex model, you can explain any motion. It doesn't necessarily mean the model is correct. Okay. So here's just some, here's a movie of the geocentric model, then we'll switch to the heliocentric model. Earth's at the center. You have the planets going around the Earth but they're also moving on their epicycles, so you're getting the retrograde motions there. Quite complicated to look at, but there's just a little model of it there. The inner planets are moving faster, so you've gone through many orbits and many retrograde motions, where the outer planets, like Saturn, they also have Uranus and Neptune out here, barely moving. And that's the geocentric model. With one one subtlety is not being shown there. In that movie, you do not see the daily motion. We know that everything rises in the east and sets in the west. What you saw there was just the motions with respect to the distant stars. The true geocentric model would take that, and as that movie's playing, that was probably about a year and a half's worth of time. In a year and a half, uh, the whole sky would additionally rotate like 500 times. So imagine me taking the projector there and spinning it 500 times during that movie. That's the geocentric model. So nowadays, you explain with the rotation of the Earth, but if you take out Earth's rotation, those are the remaining motions with respect to the stars. Okay, so that's the geocentric model. Questions about that? 